Hello, I'm JW, and uh, we're going to have a look at that electric motor today. Uh, this is really an example of what happens when you think, uh, well, we'll just have a uh, quick look inside to uh, see what the noise was. And then the next thing you know is that uh, this has happened. So as you can see, we've taken the whole thing apart, removed both the ends and uh, taken the middle out, and there's other parts as well. So just have a quick look at uh, what we've got here. Now, this piece in the middle here is the main body of the motor. And have a look inside. What we've got here are basically coils of wire around the edge, so it's probably copper with enamel coating, and there's a huge amount of that in there, which is many watts, so heavy. And then inside we've got these bars, and when you put uh, electric current through the coils here, these turn into magnets. And because it's an AC motor, these are alternating magnets as well, so they're positive and then negative and positive and so on, or north and south if you want to think of it like that. And you see there's a whole load of those, they go all the way around inside, and uh, basically that's just a magnetic field being created in there. Now that part there is called the stator, and it's called that because it's stationary, as in it doesn't move. And that's the only part with any kind of electrical connection in it, so it's just a big coil of wire arranged in a particular way to give you a certain amount of magnets around inside. And then the part in the middle, which is this bit, this is called the rotor, and it rotates. And all we've got here is basically some metal bars, as you can see going along here with a very thin gap between them, a bit of uh, gunk stuck on there, and there's lots of these all the way around, and essentially these have no electrical connection whatsoever, but if you put them inside here, you've got an alternating magnetic field there, and because of that you'll actually get an electric current induced in these windings, very much like a transformer. Now if you think of this as a transformer, it's essentially like a transformer with a whole load of shorted turns, so you're going to get a fairly high current flowing through these, and because you get current throwing through a conductor, then you get a magnetic field in this as well. And because these are arranged in such a way with those ones inside, what will actually happen is that the magnets in there will sort of repel and attract alternately on these things, and that's what actually makes this thing rotate. And it rotates at the speed set by the mains frequency, and also how this is wound. This is a four-pole motor, and therefore it's determined on the 50 hertz in this case, four poles, and that works out at 1500 RPM, as we saw in the previous video. Now the other parts on here we've got, I've got this thing at the end here, this is just a cooling fan, and because this is an old motor, this is actually made out of cast metal. New ones, of course, would probably be some junk plastic, so that's a metal piece there. This is just the output shaft, and you can see here where the thing is actually fixed on, it's actually bizarrely a keyed shaft, the uh, slot there is all gnashed and mashed to pieces, so goodness knows what's been happening there, but the actual uh, pulley is secured with a couple of little grub screw things, which just basically press down into the metal there and lock it into position. So uh, there's the little marks on that one, so it just slips over and uh, fixes down there. Cooling fan there, and you see there are actually holes through the centre of the thing there as well, that's just for cooling purposes to on this end as well. Now on this end here we've got the uh, centrifugal switch, and this is what was making that dreadful rattling and clattering deal. And the deal here is that uh, when this is stationary, of course, it's just sitting in that position, but when the thing turns round, these will move outwards like this, and therefore press on a switch in the outer end casing. So spring-loaded, so it springs back in, but uh, when it's rotating the forces just move that outwards, which presses on the switch to uh, disconnect the start winding. So Relatively simple thing. This was all gunked up before. I've put a picture on uh, Instagram where you can see that, but uh, it is actually working. It's just sort of crudded up, so we'll deal with that later. And again, at this end, we've just got the uh, piece that goes into the end bearing. A couple of little uh, washers or spring things there just to align that properly. This is the end housing, and this is actually the switch, which is operated by that thing that we saw on the rotor there. And essentially what happens is that's where the end of the shaft goes in, so it just fits in the bottom in there. And then this is the switch, so in the normal position it's here, and it's actually these contacts here, so you just see the wire there that comes off and goes around the back comes out there. And then this wire is what connects over there, I have to disconnect that because it's obviously very short, as you can see there. So in normal operation, when it's off, it's sitting in this position, and that's done because of the things inside will obviously be sprung loaded to return to that. So the start winding is connected, and then when the motor starts turning and rotating, those weights on the other part will move outwards, and they will pull against this piece here. 
and that will basically open the contacts here so the start winding isn't connected anymore and then conversely when the motor slows down and gets to a stop then it will again press against this piece and just click it back into the closed position ready for starting and again I've cleaned this up quite a bit though it's still fairly filthy so that's just basically a simple on and off switch so that's in the stop position and that's in the run position now we can see the windings uh, in here and these are the ends of the windings there's two of them this is one part of the start winding and then the other one is what goes around there and comes up the top and then we've got two other wires which are the main run winding and essentially the run winding is connected all the time so basically a line of neutral just going in there and then the start winding again it's line of neutral but it's only connected while the switch is in the closed position and then as soon as it's up to speed that will open and then you're just left with the single run winding connected up there. Now the way that this actually is supposed to work is that if you just connected the run winding it would actually magnetize all these parts but it wouldn't actually rotate it would just basically sit there and vibrate backwards and forwards at the mains frequency because of course it's just sitting there there's no actual rotation it is literally just an alternating magnetic field so the start winding is a completely separate set of windings and it's wound slightly differently and somewhat offset and it may well have a different inductance and other kinds of things as well so that's just enough to pull it in the required direction and then once it's going it will basically keep going and bring up to speed of the mains frequency in the magnetic field and then once it is going you don't need this anymore so hence it is disconnected and it's usually disconnected because these uh, quite often will overheat if they're left in circuit permanently and then you end up with the motor burning out and being destroyed so it is important that they uh, do actually disconnect when required. Now this is the end plate this is from the uh, other end but they're both very similar and someone in a comment I can't remember who it was did say that these are for lubrication which they are so you take that off and then you either put oil or grease in there to lubricate the bearing and it basically just comes down through inside into the bearing here in the middle. Now it turns out these are actually for oil in the case of this motor and if we have a look in the middle here we can see there's a tube which basically comes down from the top there and it ends up just on the top of there and we can tell it's oil because there's this sort of fibrous uh, rope in here which also goes across the top there so when you put oil in it will soak into that and then come down into the bearing here and then these will be just to soak up any excess in case people put in far too much so this is definitely an oil type rather than putting grease into it this had a cork gasket here which again gives you some idea of the age of this thing because clearly you don't use cork gaskets on that sort of thing anymore but uh, essentially it's just oil in the top some comes through into the bearing here and then these just soak up any excess on the side and there is a plate that goes over the top of that which is this so that just sits over the top there and then there's another ring which goes over the top of that and then just screws to secure it down into the four positions now this end is the exact same it's the same kind of bearing there and if I have a look there it does have on the side there the same port there for putting oil in so that's pretty much what you would expect now let's take this out and uh, what we can see there is there's actually a spring inside so that presses on the back of this when it's in there and that'll be just to stop this from accidentally unscrewing so if it was just sitting in there vibration could cause this to rotate so the spring just puts a bit of pressure on the back to basically lock it in position so it doesn't uh, vibrate out of place which obviously will be undesirable because then it will be lost and the spring just sits in there and that just goes basically straight through down into the bearing now in terms of what bearings we've got here there's no fancy ball bearings or quality stuff this is just some cheap presumably bronze uh, bushing kind of arrangement and you can hopefully just about see in the hole there and you see it's got those grooves actually cut into the side and that's where the oil would flow down from the top and again just hopefully see on the sides there so it is literally just a sleeve and it's got the grooves cut in where the oil goes in and of course that comes through from the top where we saw that hole previously so uh, just a little bit of oil dripping down inside and then the shaft is just uh, steel there so it's literally just two metals one against the other with a thin layer of oil between them to prevent them seizing up and overheating so a very cheap arrangement certainly this was not a quality motor but 
given it was probably some wartime effort or just after, no doubt uh, cost of manufacture and materials was of concern, so basically some cheap effort. And so the other one is exactly the same, uh, again just this goes into the hole with the presumably brass or bronze bushing or whatever, a bit of oil drips through from the hole, and that is pretty much it. So in terms of that wine, if it is the uh, bearing, loosely put, then it's too bad because there's not really much you can do with this. In theory you could take this uh, sleeve out and replace it, but uh, we're certainly not going to be doing that because there's no particular point on this. As I said in the other video, you can just buy in a whole new motor for about £70, so uh, if anything on this catastrophically fails, there's really no point in trying to repair or replace any of it. Now someone in the other video says, where's this schematic? Well, there isn't one because a single phase motor this is that temporary bit of wire I just put in for testing. So all we've got in here is the line to this terminal here, neutral to that one, then earth goes over to the metal case on the side. So it is literally just two connections here. You can see the other wires coming off here. There's actually two on each, so there's two coming off the line and then some off the neutral as well. And that's purely because of the start and the run winding. So they just basically come across to the same two terminals here. This does have an extra two terminals, but they're not actually used, so presumably it would be a three-phase version when you obviously have the three phases rather than just the line and neutral. So uh, that's pretty much all there is to connect on these things. It is literally just line and neutral, and then earth goes over to your metal case, and they've just brought the two windings up here, the two ends of the two windings to the terminals separately. And uh, say the run windings are permanently connected, and the start winding one end is permanently connected and the other one goes via the switch, which we saw earlier. So that's a quick look at the uh, electric motor. And uh, this is uh, basically how all of these induction type motors actually operate. All the electrical parts are in the outer casing and just the uh, cores are around the edge. And then the middle has no electrical connection whatsoever. So there's no brushes or anything else like that. It's just uh, magnetism acting on here, which creates a current and then that creates a magnetic field, which can then be attracted or repelled via the other one. And that's uh, pretty much it. So induction motors uh, are a very popular style, very reliable because again there's not much to go wrong. The only thing that can go wrong are your windings can overheat and short together and burn away, in which case it's either have it rewound or in the case of small motors like this throw it away and just buy a new one. Bigger ones you could have uh, rewound if you wanted to. And of course the bearings or severe lack of in this case which is just a sleeve in this case so if it's worn out well uh, Theoretically you could replace, but the reality is again you're not going to bother, you're just going to buy a whole new motor. And the uh, pulley on this one, not entirely clear why it's uh, made like this, but uh, look at the middle there, it is just a circular hole and it attaches with a couple of little screws there, so one there and one over there. And yet bizarrely the actual shaft, as you see here, is actually a keyed shaft, so there would normally be a metal key which goes in here and there'll be a corresponding slot in that one to lock the two together. But as we can see here, it's not actually used because that doesn't even have a slot for a key. And uh, goodness knows what's happened to this. It's all uh, mashed and destroyed anyway, so not really clear what they've been doing with that. So I'll uh, attempt to clean this up a bit further and uh, put it all back together and uh, clean up that switch because it did look to be in reasonable condition. And just another thing, if you are going to take stuff like this apart, always a good idea to put a mark on the casing here so you can tell where the end covers go with respect to where it was previously, because obviously this is round, so it could theoretically go in any position. And of course the same over the front here, so we've got a mark there. And of course a corresponding one on the case like that, so when it goes back together you can line them up. So a quick look at the other motor, and uh, that's pretty much it for this time. Not uh, a video it was necessarily intended or planned, but uh, nevertheless we might as well have a look while it's uh, taken apart. And hopefully it will go back together, I mean so there's not a lot in it to break, but uh, We'll find out uh, when I've reassembled it later. So until next time, thanks for watching.